Welcome to tea with Erping. Calligraphy is regarded as the highest Chinese art, even more so than the Chinese landscape painting. It's an art form developed for thousands of years. At first glance, it can seem intimidating, but if you can give some time to first understand the history, you find the artworks will reward you with endless enjoyment. In the future, so what is calligraphy? The Western word calligraphy is of Greek origin. It means beautiful writing. In Chinese, calligraphy is called shu fa. The word shu literally means book, and the word fa means law or method. So the two characters together translate into the art of writing. Did you know that these are all Chinese calligraphy? From its earliest forms 3,000 years ago up to present day, Chinese calligraphy tells the story of a civilization. So in a way, calligraphy could also be called the art of China's history. I studied calligraphy in elementary school, watching my father do it from time to time. He was an old school scholar who began writing with brush pens when he grew up in the 1930s. So he taught me how to use the pen and make the black ink from the ink stone, as well as the writing styles. When I got older, I came to appreciate the intricacy of calligraphy and the inner meaning. I will demonstrate some calligraphy writing later in the video. So, how did writing, something you and I do every single day, become such a prominent art form in China? Today, let's explore the history of calligraphy and then look at some greatest calligraphy masters. First, for those who are not familiar with the Chinese language, here's a quick primer. The Chinese language is the oldest language in continuous use. As well as the only surviving logographic language in the world. Its development is unique. A single word in Chinese could be made up of several characters, and each character from a unique variety of strokes, making it a written language very rich with symbols. This is quite different compared with Western calligraphy which is based on the original 23-letter Latin alphabet. There are over 50,000 characters in the Chinese language, and no alphabet, so you must learn each character independently. If you are familiar with two to three thousands of those, it's enough to read the newspaper, and you'll be fine to go about your daily life. The Chinese language is really an incredible thing. Let's dive in. Throughout of Chinese history, five major styles of calligraphy emerged. When we think of calligraphy, we imagine scrolls of an ornate script written with brush and ink. But its early forms trace back to a time long before either of these were invented. If you watched my episode on Chinese characters, you might remember I explained the origin of Chinese characters came from the Shang dynasty, when early characters were used for divination, and the inscriptions were carved onto animal bones and rock. When the Shang dynasty was overthrown, the Zhou dynasty created the Mandate of Heaven. This established the belief that the legitimacy of rule is granted by gods. The writing style used at this time retained the long rectangular shapes with slightly rounded corners. These became known as the Great Seal style. Da Zhuan. It would be many hundred of years later before the written language could change again. Qin Shi Huang became the first emperor and established the Qin dynasty. He unified the land of China, and in short 11 years of rule as emperor, he built the Great Wall of China, set down the rule of law 
standardized Chinese currency, among many other things. And he introduced the basis of a uniform written language for the country. This became known as the small seal style, Xiao Zhuan. With the invention of paper and higher quality animal hair brushes, Chinese calligraphy was well and truly established in the Han. It was China's longest lasting dynasty that writing became widely used for official purposes. And writing with the brush and ink became the norm. And it made sense to have everyone use the same writing style, the clerical script, Li Shu. With downward sweeping strokes with taping ends, this style is perfectly suited for writing swiftly with a brush. Shapes of characters written in this style have a certain rhythm and a dignified look. Even using the brush to create a simple horizontal stroke, known as the silkworm head and the goose tail, is dynamic to look at. Another style of calligraphy that emerged in the Han Dynasty has altogether a very different flavor. It goes by the name Cao Shu. Cao means grass, and you can also take it to mean quick or rough. Characters written in this style are extremely fluid and smooth. Even several phrases could be written at once. The brush would never leave the page. So Cao Shu follows a different rule book. If you compare the two, you can see how it departs from the rules of the stalwart styles to simplify the details of a character formation in favor of the abstract form and the overall image. This expressive style reached its height of popularity some 500 years later in the Tang Dynasty. Towards the end of Han Dynasty, Kai Shu or standard script style emerged. It features distinct thinner, linear strokes and is rectangular, uniform, and easy to read. Very much the opposite of Cao Shu. Today, we see this style used everywhere in print and also online. This style looks simple, but in actuality, you would need strong discipline and many years of dedication to master all the 37 brush strokes of this style. The development of calligraphy reached its peak in the Jin Dynasty, with a new fifth style of calligraphy, Xing Shu, or running script. It is artistic and lively with a rounded shape, but still have enough form that most people could easily read the characters. This is perhaps the most loved of all script styles, and holds the middle ground between Kai Shu and Cao Shu. These three scripts the cursive script, standard script, and the running script appeared during the time of six dynasties. This was a time of division, as the land of China became separated into different kingdoms. But many of China's most famous calligraphers emerged in this period of time. Together, the five scripts would become like canon. Later calligraphers in Tang and Song dynasties would look to these earlier styles for the foundation of their own artworks. This was a time when calligraphy became more closely associated with poetry and cultural learning. Calligraphers continued to develop their own styles and showed more individual and personal flair. the golden ages of China, the Tang and Song dynasties, were also the golden ages for calligraphy. Towards the end of Song in particular, calligraphy reached its peak. This led to a term being coined, the four treasures of a scholarly studio. So what are the four treasures? This refer to the tools needed for calligraphy, a writing brush, traditionally made from animal hair, paper, and an ink stick and an ink stone. When you grind the ink stick on the ink stone and add water, you could form ink. 
The tools are few and simple, but they vary in quality and have become precious collectibles among the literati. Since the Tang Dynasty, students began with the Kai Shu to learn the fundamentals, starting first with the Ba Fa, or Eight Rules. All the brush strokes in calligraphy come from these eight basic strokes. Interestingly, all these strokes can be found in one character, Yong. Yong stands for endurance and perseverance. Here I'm doing a demonstration of Yong. Like the lotus flower blossoming out of the mud, this is a core value found in Chinese and all Eastern cultures. Studying Chinese calligraphy can open a window to the world of Eastern philosophy. How so? Here are some of the criteria traditionally used to judge these artworks. It includes qing, qi, shen, jing, yun, fa, yi, feng ge, qi du, and so on and so forth. Well, this may seem complicated at first. It all has to do with the Chinese belief in the relationship between heaven, earth, and humanity. At its essence, calligraphy was seen as a way to become closer to the divine ideal of being one with the Tao, or to know one's universal nature. Through practicing the arts, a person could aspire to reach that. That's something everyone can appreciate. Taoism, founded by Lao Tzu, has had a lasting impact on calligraphy and many areas of Chinese culture. And when you look at the calligraphy through this lens, the experience becomes even richer. When people talk about finding beauty in the composition, there's another layer of meaning. The sophisticated calligrapher writes with perfect balance balance of white and black, thick and thin, big and small, smooth and rough, dark ink and light ink, just as the Taoist principles teach of harmony between yin and yang. Earlier, I mentioned the Chinese saying zi ru qi ren, meaning handwriting shows one's personality. It is said that a person's philosophy can influence their calligraphy. What goes on on the inside shows on the outside. To achieve a state of inner peace, calligraphers would aspire to find balance in themselves and return to simplicity, and then it would show in their writing. Chinese believe that the person and their artwork embody the same nature. Confucian teachings have also had their influence in calligraphy. For example, Confucian tastes follow the golden mean. The writing typically looks full, centered, and firm, indicating righteousness and a sense of inner confidence, without recklessness. Yan Zhenqing, a loyal official in the Tang Dynasty, was such a Confucian. You won't forget this man or his calligraphy after you learn his story at the An Lushan Rebellion. Yan was alone on enemy grounds. His MO was to negotiate with rebel leader Li Xilie. Li tried all means to get Yan to surrender to him, but Yan never gave in. Legend says that one day Li set up a fire in the courtyard and told Yan if he didn't surrender, he would be thrown straight into the fire. Yan resolutely stood up and, without hesitation, walked himself into the fire. The order was given to have him pulled out. Li couldn't help but feel respect for Yan after that, and he let Yan leave the camp. To me, Yan exemplified what a man of honor and virtue should be, a true Confucian indeed. This is Yan Qinli's Dili, Yan's most famous work, which was completed after the rebellion. Yan Zhenqing was in the later years of his life when he carved these words of tribute into stone to commemorate his great-grandfather Yan Shi Gu. Yan Zhenqing was lucky enough to be born into a literary family. 
His great grandfather was a famous historian and linguist, and his father Yan Weizhen tutored Tang Dynasty princes. In the city, you can see his style is actually full of life, and at the same time shows the highest level of control. The Yan Qinli city would become referenced and copied countless times by future students who admired this morally upright and stately style. Now there is another calligrapher we have to get to know. For thousands of years, he has been regarded as the all-time greatest calligrapher. His name was Wang Xizhi. When Emperor Wu of Liang Dynasty saw this piece by Wang Xizhi, this is what he said about the calligraphy. A dragon leaping at the gate of heaven, a tiger crouching at the phoenix tower. China's emperor was impressed, and he wrote these remarks on the scroll next to Wang's calligraphy. It was common for emperors to leave remarks on important artworks, to leave a legacy for future generations. Through it, we are able to get a better sense of cultural value. The Emperor Taizong of Tang Dynasty was also a fan. He collected more than 2,000 pieces of Wang Xizhi calligraphy and even composed the entry to his biography for the official history of Jin Dynasty. With that, Wang Xizhi would enjoy an eternal place in China's history. Wang's most famous piece was preface to the poems composed at the Orchid Pavilion. In the year 353 AD, Wang invited 41 fellow literati friends to come enjoy a poetry contest at the Orchid Pavilion alongside a flowing stream. Cups of rice wine floated downstream. If a cup stopped in front of them, that person would write a poem. And we assume that they would enjoy their beverage afterwards. Altogether, 26 guests composed 37 poems. Observing that spring day among lofty mountains and slender bamboo, Wang was inspired to write his famous preface. As Wang reflected on the perfect afternoon, his words revealed a lasting sentiment that resonates with every one of us. Future generations will look upon us just like we look upon our past. How sad! Hence, we record people presented here today and their works, even though time and circumstance will be different. The feelings expressed will remain unchanged. Future readers shall also emphasize with the same by reading this poetry collection. So why is this piece so admired? Wang Xizhi mastered many script styles, but it is running script that is his most famous for. Preface is perhaps the finest example. Look closely at the characters. Can you tell how some elements in the individual characters seem to pull away from each other, yet each character holds its own space? This marks Wang Xizhi's style, and is one of the ways you can tell his work apart from those of other running scripts. Another interesting thing is how Wang playfully used characters. The character Zhi, which by itself means off, and the same character in Wang Xizhi's name, is used 20 times, and each time Wang is able to write it differently. The characters are written spontaneously, yet each carries its own flavor. You might be wondering what kind of man Wang Xizhi was. Born in 303 AD in the Jin Dynasty, Wang came from a family of renowned writers, and he began practicing calligraphy when he was seven years old. He was so diligent when writing, he would forget to eat. After practice, he would clean his brushes outdoors in the pond. He did it so often, he turned the color of the water to ink. Wang Xizhi, the calligrapher, was also a Taoist. He took inspiration from the natural world, and his smooth calligraphic style was often likened to the grace and ease of the geese he liked to keep. Here we see Wang Xizhi and his young attendant enjoying a peaceful scene, overlooking the water from a pavilion. 
Two white geese swim towards them. It is said while watching how the geese move their long necks, one enlightened to the principles of calligraphy and the ideal wrist movements, which he adopted in his writing. Like his forefathers who held prestigious positions in government, Wang also took office, but he cared little for fame and the renown that came with it. And in his later years, he resigned to devote himself to his passion, calligraphy. As for preface to Lan Ting Xu, after word got out, countless copies were written by Wang's peers and contemporaries. His words have been engraved on stone, emperors have commissioned sculptures, and landscape paintings have been created, all inspired by the story of Lan Ting Xu. The original is said to have been buried with Emperor Taizong, and today, no original works of his remain, which makes this man's art priceless. We are now halfway through our introduction of the art of calligraphy. Perhaps this is a proper time for a tea break. In the next episode, I will share about an even more dynamic period of Chinese calligraphy, including my own encounters with this art form. As a Chinese proverb says, he who returns from a journey is not the same as he who left. I have a feeling that you are not the same person now, having traveled this far in the history of Chinese calligraphy. No one has lived in the past, or the future, only the now. Perhaps a cup of tea can help keep your world sane. Thanks for watching. Until next time, peace and tea be with you. Thank you.